Wicked, which is about to celebrate its 10th anniversary on Broadway in October. <laughs> but, but I thought this would be interesting, since most of you are creators and writers, to go back in time to more than a decade ago as to how that monumental success began. Uh, I will just say, start off by saying that I know that Stephen Schwartz was uh, on this beautiful beach with several friends, and one of them was reading a book, and Stephen asked, what are you reading? And she said, it's a book called Wicked. It's the backstory of the uh, Wicked Witch of the West, and I will let Stephen take the story from yeah, that point on. Yeah, that's close. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in 1996, I was um, spending most of my time in Los Angeles. I was doing animated features. I was very happy uh, doing that and had decided that it, I was having a much better time and being much better treated than uh, working in, in New York and particularly on Broadway and that I wasn't going to do theater anymore. Um, and towards the end of 1996, I went on a brief sort of weekend vacation uh, with some friends of mine who were working in Hawaii and we went on a snorkeling trip in Maui and on the boat on the way back, one of these friends, the folk singer Holly Near, um, said, making idle conversation, oh, I'm reading this really interesting book. It's uh, by this guy named Gregory Maguire, and it's a book called Wicked, and it's sort of the Oz story from the Wicked Witch's point of view. And I, um, it happened again. Every time I say that sentence, sort of the <laughs> hairs on my body stand up. Uh, I just thought that was one of the best ideas I'd ever heard and so right for me in so many ways. And so the next day when I flew back to uh, Los Angeles, I called my lawyer and I said, okay, there is this book called Wicked and somebody has the rights because it's been out for a while. Um, and I think I need to do this, so I'm gonna go out and f get the book and um, you need to find out who has the rights. And then a whole, in, very elaborate journey then commenced. It turned out, and, and I'm telling you all of this because as writers, the sort of how you actually get to do something is often something that I'm asked. Um, it, it turned out that the rights were held by Demi Moore's production company, which had a deal with Universal, and that they were in the process of adapting it as a movie, uh, there was a screenplay being written by Linda Wolverton, who I happen to know from Disney and who I think is a really good writer. Non-musical, though. Non-musical. Uh, and they were in, on the second draft of the screenplay. And uh, so I tracked down, I got a meeting with uh, Suzanne Todd, who was running Demi's, uh, Demi Moore's company at the time, and, and, and with Linda, and tried to talk them into... Um, considering doing it as a musical, they were not interested in doing that. And then uh, I sort of worked my way up the food chain and eventually got to got a meeting with the uh, gentleman who was then running um, Universal Pictures, whose name was Mark Platt. And I had very little hope uh, uh, prior to this meeting because of the attitude, particularly at that time, of movie studios towards musicals because why would they do that? Because uh, you can't really make too much money. I, um, I see Carol Hall sitting there who is one of the only people I <laughs> cited her movie as a reason why they should consider doing a musical uh, on uh, a Broadway musical. Anyway, um, I walked into Mark Platt's office and before the meeting commenced, he sang Corner of the Sky to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Because it turned out that he had been in Pippin in college. Uh, so I, I consider this a good sign. Uh, and basically made a pitch to Mark saying, look, I, I know that you're uh, doing this as a movie. Uh, I don't think it's going to work as a movie. Here are the reasons I don't think it will work. I think it needs to be uh, a, a musical. And, and therefore a stage musical, and I really want to do this and think I kind of know how. So um, 
please think about this. And then there was a very discouraging year that followed where it looked as if that was not going to happen and then maybe they would pursue it on parallel tracks. And basically when I left the office, Mark gave me a, a, a folder of all the movies that Universal had ever produced to see if there was anything else in there that I might want to consider <laughs> doing as a musical. Uh, and, um, and then I started to despair and I started to make lists of other villains that might maybe make uh, the center of a musical and there was Iago and there was <laughs> the wicked queen from Snow White and everything and none of them really seemed to, to have the same excitement as, as uh, the Wicked Witch. And then finally uh, I got a call from Mark saying that um, he had thought about it and he had come to feel that the arguments I made were compelling um, and it turned out that, uh, in fact, Linda Wolverton was not interested in, in pursuing it in, in this way. Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I started to think about whom I might want to work with. Uh, and then very fortuitously, um, a producer at Disney um, had a uh, whom both Winnie and I knew, Jim Pentecost, uh, who, had, who was the producer of, Pe of uh, Pocahontas, had lunch for us at Disney where the two of us met to talk about this project that Jim pitched. I can't even remember what it was because well, all knows? we did was talk about Wicked. But, but <laughs> when we had that wonderful lunch, that um, important lunch, you were in your middle of your despair. You hadn't gotten permission. Oh, I hadn't gotten the rights yet? Okay. No, because what happened, it was just a weird moment where he, you brought up, like, if only there was a, we could think of a good idea to do for an animated show. Oh, like Wicked. Like Wicked. And I was, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, you know that book? And then I heard the tale and of, you know, that you had not been able to get the rights to that. So I remember very well, because then months later, ah, okay, you right called me and said, I, sit down, because I think we, I think, I'm gotten the right, so I think you might want to read the book now. Because <laughs> I had never read the book. I had literally seen the cover of the book and thought it was so arresting that I bought the book. Uh, and I, too, had done a, a right search. This is weird. This is, you know, we didn't really know each other then. But when I heard that it was being already made into, a, that someone had already started a screenplay, first of all, I didn't have the insight Stephen had that it should be a musical on Broadway. I didn't understand that then. I was just looking into it to, as a screenwriter, actually. And when I heard they already had a screenwriter, they already started, I was so depressed I didn't, I didn't read the book. So, <laughs> <laughs> but a, a, a weird little known fact, and it's just funny, is the book, which the original one, the original novel, had this green girl with a dark, with her dark hat, very, very interesting looking girl, you know, with a slightly green face, but it was hid, half hidden um, on the cover. And I had that on my bookshelf in my workroom for, for a long time. It sort of peered out at me. And, you know, literally later I started to think, wow, that's kind of interesting that I had it right prominently displayed on my bookshelf for like two years before I started working on it. Stranger than true. Right. So, uh, so now it was 1998, we think, right? Like yes. Towards the end of 1998, it, yes. and we we had gotten the um, the go ahead, and I had met with Gregory Maguire um, because he had to give his blessing and um, drove up to his where he was staying in Connecticut and walked around with him and told him sort of what my thoughts were and. Um, he did. He did give his blessing, and then um, we began. And we started um, by trying to do an outline of the of the show. What what would the the basic structure uh, be? And I think I had well, done you, something. Well, you had. He had written a preliminary outline, but also I think it bears mentioning. It's very important. You had. You had a vision from the beginning of the way you wanted the show to begin. Yeah. The curtain at the at the end of the first, first act, act and the very end. You had he had a very strong vision. He'd been thinking about this for a while. And um, 
is incredibly smart. <laughs> and um, so the, that the whole, his, what, he, what, he, what he pitched to me originally was, is what we have, which is the show would begin with this celebration that is not unlike Ding Dong the Witch is Dead, but it's not that, but it is like that, because it's happening in Oz and they're celebrating the death of a witch. The f end of the first act is going to be this moment when she first flies on her broomstick. I believe that's what you yeah, said. Yeah, absolutely. And then the end of the show, although it's changed from how we, we both originally um, in started to envision it, but the end of the show, I, I think you, I think you said to me immediately, can we say spoilers in here? Has, okay. uh, that you, kn you knew that you didn't want her to die, as in Gregory's book, uh, does, she, does she die in the book? It's uh, ambiguous. Well, I mean, obviously, obviously in the movie she dies. Yeah, yeah. It's and ambiguous in, the, in, in Gregory's book. So yeah. he was very clear, this was his vision. So I was, you know, really on board with that and f was feeling it too. And then, so in other words, we had those, those three very key structural tent poles that we then started outlining th from. Yeah. And there were things, uh, and, and Winnie, um, it was so great that she, that she did this. So she brought the first outline that then we did together, yes. which is now dated um, November of 99. So, uh, so it took about a year really just to get to, to this, because the book had so much plot that yes. it was really difficult to figure out what to use and what not to use and what to change and, and so on. But what I was just glancing at this as we were waiting to begin, and what was, what's really interesting is that even though everything changed, kind of those three things never changed. Um, the specifics of how they were executed and, and, and yes. who Ex was involved and who wasn't yeah. changed. But, but that was always the structure, that it began with the, the celebration of the witch's death, that it then flashed back, um, that at the end of the show you would come back to that same celebration, but see it in a completely different way and learn that a lot of what you thought was true um, was actually a, a masquerade and a charade and that there was a lot of stuff going on that you didn't know about and that the end of the first act would be the witch coming into her power and, and flying for the first time. And there were a couple of other things that we knew. Um, we well, the roommate's thing. Yes. Well, that was, in, that was in Gregory's book. That was something that spoke to both of us right away was that these, the, the, the bad witch, the, the wicked witch, and Glinda the Good Witch had been reluctant roommates at college. And in the book, and we just thought that was hilarious oh, and brilliant. It's, it's so the, other, the other thing I should say that I think was really key because it was something that I had not thought of before him. When I first envisioned the show, before I started talking to Winnie about it, I had seen it as a show kind of like Funny Girl in that there would be one main character and she would drive through the show and that's who you would follow. And then when I started talking with Winnie about it, Winnie had the insight of how important the, that the relationship was more significant than, than this one character's journey and that it was more lo like a Rodgers and Hammerstein show. Uh, where, where you had to balance two major characters who, and, and, and the journey they would take together and how their relationship would change would be the center of the show. And then the other thing that I thought was really, you said at our very first meeting, and I, I never forgot, was that you felt it was very important that Elphaba the Wicked Witch actually do something that was wicked that it not be that she was just this misunderstood good girl and the, you know, the others were bad and you simply flipped who was black and who was white, um, but that we wanted it to be very nuanced. And so then we looked for an incident, a, a thing that she would do that was actually wicked. And, we came, and that's where the idea of a relationship between Glinda and Fiero 
which is not in the book. They don't have a relationship in the novel. And that's, that's where that came from, and that therefore Elphaba knowing about that relationship but taking the guy anyway yeah, I was a betrayal be, of her best friend. I it wanted her wicked. to have behaved badly in some ways. And obviously, you know, we've all behaved badly. Um, <laughs> some more badly than others, I guess. But um, in other words, we've all done things that we know weren't what another person wanted us to do, but we couldn't help ourselves or we felt that it was more true you know, that whole thing about it's more true to lie in a certain moment than it is to, um, but anyway, yeah, I and, I, and and then I think, you know, just to say that something we've said publicly a lot, but I'll just say it since we're on the subject, is that, you know, then another element of the Glinda, Glinda part rising up had to do with Kristen. Yeah. And from the very beginning, when we were very first writing it, um, Stephen had said to me, there's this girl um, named Kristen Chenoweth, and I was living in LA, and I, wasn't really a part of the New York theater scene, um, nor, nor am I still, really. Um, but I did not really, I knew who Kristen was, but I'd never really seen her on stage, I don't think. I knew she'd wanted Tony, but I didn't really know her. Well, when Stephen was able to get her to come to our, a read, an early reading that we did, I was so blown away by her enormous gifts that I determined, I mean, we both did, I don't mean to use the I, we both, felt very strongly it should be her. Now that's like saying that you sort of buy a Ferrari, but you just take it down the driveway and then just bring it back. You know, you, if you have a Ferrari, you have to take it for a spin. And so then it became very important. How is her part going to arc? What, what's in it for her? You know, flat out. You know, here's a rising star. Just. Why, is she, why does she want to do our part? That's, a, that's something, you know, people don't always talk about that, but um, actually Martha Levy, I think, referred to that last night. I was very taken with that moment uh, in, her, in her conversation. I'm always thinking about that stuff. Um, I don't know if that is something that yeah, well, people should want an to actor, talk about. Can an actor play this why role would an actor want to? want to? And motivating and a, a truly, and I don't just mean a star, but somebody who's really got a lot going on in that department, making sure that you're showing them off, not the other way around, i.e., they're going to come in, do my show, and make it work. <laughs> no, no, no. The thinking would need to be, I'm going to write a part that so shows them off and, sho and so shows all their colors that they're going to not be able to resist to play it. That's more the thinking that I like to, to be in. Yeah. And um, then just quickly, and then we'll, we can start you know, answering questions, et cetera. So the way we developed the show then was we, um, once we had an outline uh, that we felt we had gone over and over and over again, and now we're starting to go around in circles a little bit, and therefore it was time to move forward, then we, we started to write, and um, Winnie, uh, uh, for me as a, as a songwriter, um, I always like it if the book writer does, goes first and gives me a, um, a few scenes so I understand the tone and how the characters speak and so on and so forth. And I, I, Winnie wrote um, the first couple of scenes and, and particularly I remember when I got the first draft of the first, the, the opening from you, and there were all these strange words that, were, that we came to call Ozisms, and, and that Winnie was inventing a, a language in a way, a way of talking to help separate Oz from, uh, from our world. And, and so that was very influential on me. I thought, oh, well, then I have to, I have to write lyrics that way, too. Um, and anyway, eventually we, we got ourselves to, um, to a first act, and we were uh, working with Mark Platt, um, who became the producer of the show, and we would keep running things by him and discussing things with him, and then finally it got to a point where we felt we needed to hear it read, and that was probably about another year down the line, and I would remember, say. the first time we heard it read, we only had Act One. We had Act One, which was, yeah. We had an Act One that was as long, longer than the play The show is now, is now. yeah. <laughs> 
And I remember, and we had been, again, we had started to go around and around in circles with it until we finally thought, like, you know what, we, we have to read the, hear this read. And Mark was very um, resistant to that idea, and he was sort of terrified. And well, I, I was had terrified. I had a conversation about it, and so, uh, you know, finally I called Mark in and I said, um, so we're going to do this reading, and you, if you want to... Um, be the producer and you know pay for it great if not we're doing it you're cordially invited but but we're doing it so then of course he said oh well then of course we'll put it together for you um, and we just uh, you know, invited some actor friends of ours uh, this wasn't the Kristen reading this yeah. is it's just act one it's two two hours long or two and a half hours long and um, <laughs> The thing that I just want to say for, for all of us that was so key, what Stephen put, Stephen's wisdom was he invited, I guess you invited about 20, would you say like 40? The, no, less than that. No. I think it was less than 20. I think it was about 12 sort of smart People friends. People he felt were very, his smartest friends. And I think I had like two friends there. <laughs> and um, I have a lot of friends, but um, I, was, I was scared. But anyway, but what he did, which was so amazing to me, because I'd never done something like this before, because in other words, my thinking, and this is why I want to share this with you, would be, I have to wait till it's done. Done, right? But what this did was it catapulted us into a lot more knowledge and into really understanding what, what we had and what we didn't have yet. So after the reading was over, this is just the first act, he, he, he and I sat in the middle of the room, me against my will and Stephen willingly, <laughs> and, and just asked people, Stephen just asked people questions like, what didn't you get? What was, where did you lose interest? You know, and we took notes. Yeah. And that's a real you know, ballsy, obviously, move. But if you can do that with enough privacy that, so that you don't, so that you're not talking to people who are just totally going to lead you astray, you know, that you're talking to some trusted people who you think have good taste, you know, that can be so, that was just galvanizing for us. Yeah, and people tell you, th it, it, it sort of becomes like a bell curve, like there are always outliers who tell you things that are, are not particularly useful or, or have their own sort of odd point of view. Yeah, someone just hates monkeys, so they're Whatever. just like, yeah, oh. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I had, no, I had someone like that, a very, very close yeah. personal friend who was just like, oh, those monkeys, get rid of them, cut the monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> and the, there was no way we were going to do that, yeah. but, but. But in the middle, things start to emerge, and, and one of the uh, people who was there, I remember, said to me, whenever you have those two girls, on, particularly when they're together in action, you're in gold, and every other time you're in trouble. Just and said so it. we wrote this little thing that said, "It's the girls, stupid." <laughs> that was our mantra. That and we would keep show, We would show it to each other yeah. as we were as we were working. And then the other thing that we really learned was that people brought to brought in with them the movie. They did not bring Gregory's book, even if they'd read the book. They didn't really care if we changed it or what we did. They did not bring the original Wizard of Oz series, even if they had a prized collection of them at home and had read all 170 of them. They, that, but they all brought the movie. And what we realized was we could not contradict the movie. Any place we had gone too far away the show fell apart. So we realized two, two major things. We had to focus on the relationship between the girls and that we had to treat the movie as if it was a documentary. <laughs> that that's what yeah. really happened. That's what really yeah. happened. Yeah. Now, I mean, and, and you know, just to put another, just to add to that, you know, when you think about that, it has to do with the whole idea, you know, if you do improv and don't deny someone else's reality, you know, if anyone here is an improv person, you know, because the audience doesn't like to have their reality denied. Mm. In other words, if you're, if you're in an improv and you, and, you, and you come out and you start to crack eggs and pretend that you're flipping eggs and somebody says, you know, why are you uh, whipping a horse? And it's been so clear that you were just making eggs. It's very unpleasant for the audience and they just 
zone out. It's like, well, if you're going to do shit like that, why should I pay attention? <laughs> and so, and that, so in other words, it, it does. <laughs> So it doesn't just apply to the Wizard of Oz, is what I real. I mean, although yeah. it does so much, because this is such a treasured, this is a movie that is our national treasure. It's a national masterpiece. It's our great movie. And it's a movie that really spoke to our generation, me and Stevens, although I think it does continue to speak to generations. But you know, we grew up watching this movie at prized moments at home. On you know on little TVs that only had five channels, <laughs> yeah, it's like it was a very important event to watch the movie together as a family or to be terrified by it or whatever. So we did have to be very we br we brought our own feelings of respect and admiration and adoration, I will say, for the movie, but we also brought that thing that he's just described. But all of that, I believe, is. Um, you know, something that speaks to whatever you might be writing in terms of under, understanding what you, like not denying what you ca care about or what matters to you, because often what matters to you is really we, what matters universally. You know, it's, it, when you're tapping into something that you really care about, very, very often that's when you're really speaking to a, a bigger group, if you know what I mean. Stephen and Winnie, I'd like to pick up the story as it's getting closer to Broadway. I know that you insisted that the show open out of town, not on Broadway, and the production was in San Francisco. And I believe you also insisted that after it closed in San Francisco, you would have a certain amount of time. Why did you decide? What, what did you yeah, think you did? Yeah, need? that was, that was uh, something that, that I... Uh, actually, we wanted to do uh, a regional production. And... Um, our director, or uh, we, I actually wanted to do a workshop and then a regional production and then talk about going out of town. <laughs> and our director, uh, Joe Mantello, felt that for his purposes, um, a, to some extent a workshop, but particularly a regional production, was not valuable because he felt that he needed to get the the world and the production and um, and that, that to just have, um, sort of limited resources um, was, was not helpful to him in figuring out how to put the show on the stage. So he wanted to start right away with, a, with an out-of-town production, and I said to the producers that I would only agree to that if it was not um, a typical situation where you, you open out of town and then you kind of shut down for a, a week while you're transferring to New York, and then you go. Um, because what I had learned in my experience was you can't actually do s s really um, major structural work while the show is running. I know in the old days they seemed to change shows out of town extensively all the time, but for whatever reasons now, I've just found you can't do it. Well, we made some changes out of town. Yeah, you can make, you can make limited changes within scenes. Right. You can, right, you can do, right. it's not really cosmetic work, it's important work, but you can't do big changes because by the time something is then you have to stage it and then it has to be orchestrated and then the computer has to like figure out how to move the set and three weeks have gone by and, and, you're, and you can't do it. So I just said to the producers, if you're going to do this, we must close down for... I think it was three months, four I think, months? I think we had, well, we definitely had July and August, because it started at the end of August, the rehearsals. Yeah, or yeah, and we closed, I, mean, I think it was three months that we said, you have to close yes, the show. Yes, it was, yeah. And then, and, and let us write, and then go back into rehearsal, and the, uh, otherwise, uh, uh, otherwise we won't do it. And so the, the producers agreed, and it cost them one million dollars. To, to for that three months because they had to keep all, everybody on, on retainer. On, on retainer. But, um, but it did make the show. Yeah, they will tell you that that was the best million dollars they spent. <laughs> but it, but the the point being, it you know they were not cavalier about it. It was it was a, a decision. Can you mention was, one thing that you learned from that San Francisco production? Well, oh, yes, yeah. we learned a lot of things from the San Francisco production. The major. One of the major things that, that we worked on in the intervening three months was that the, the character of Elphaba 
and her relationship with Glinda had gone out of balance. That Glinda had, to some extent, taken over the show, and um, and there were aspects of the Elphaba character that were not coming through. And so we, her, her intelligence, her rebelliousness, her wit, um, and so we spent most of that time working on, on that character, writing new lines for her, writing new things for her to sing, et cetera, trying to, trying to kick that character back up into balance. Is that when we wrote the new, the new no, no, no. That's not what we wrote Wizard of Oz. No, 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 but, but but I did a lot of intro how, stuff for yes. her that she was not singing, it and we restructured stuff. It was all how she stuff. started out in the yeah, show. Yeah. It was virtually that. I mean, it was very little. Af it was all Act One stuff. Well, I did. I, I wrote stuff for her in Act Two, like intros and of songs and things oh. to clarify. And yeah. I don't remember that. Like the intro to For Good. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I mean, a lot of it had to do with how she started off, like getting her mm -hmm. off to the right start, at least for me, book-wise. Um, and it had to do with that. And, but then a, a huge thing that happened in San Francisco was the funeral scene. Because we'd always, well, that was big. Here it is, it's right in yeah, the outline. Yeah, it's right here. It had to, it's right in the outline, yeah. So it had to do with how, how we told our story. And we had a huge funeral scene for the goat, of who was presumed dead. Uh, and... Um, you know, a funeral is stately and long, <laughs> uh, usually, so was the scene. Um, and um, it was, it came, it came in the part of the first act where things were starting to, you know, get exhausting anyway. Because we have, we did a, a long first act, and it was before they went to the Emerald City, which in a way you're, everyone's waiting for. And it was just endless. But, you know, it's hard to know at the time, and of course this is something you all deal with, it's just so hard to understand at the time that, that you don't need something. Yeah. Well, one of the things that happened was we kept going back to our storyboards. Yes. And I remember that there were these two <gasps> cards. There was an event that happened with Morrible coming to Elphaba in the funeral scene, and then there was an event where she came to her again and yes. said, you're going to the Emerald City, and we looked at him and we were like, that's the same card. Correct. There's something is wrong here. So we can't be doing both of these. And you, um, you take two things. I mean, that's why outlining can be so important, especially in a musical, but really any in any part of life. I mean, if you um, <laughs> if you if you're seeing the do you understand what you just said? Like if you're seeing these two things and it's basically a very similar event. It's the same why beat. Aren't, why aren't they happening together? Yeah. And by the way, you know, to some extent, and then of course it can get too much, but to some extent, when you take two scenes and make one scene out of them that does the work of all of that, in other words, all, well then you have a very dynamic scene. Because one of the things I personally love is to do that because, and you can't do that often in your first draft or even in your third draft, perhaps, when you're teaching yourself the story. But in other words, when you have a scene where a lot of different things are actually, there are a lot of different dynamics actually happening, in other words, it serves more than one purpose, the scene, this can be very thrilling. You don't want to tip it over into so many things are happening in one scene that you can barely t keep track or something like that. But do you agree with this? Totally. Okay. Uh, but so, so we wound up deciding that we had to cut this funeral scene. There were two little events that happened in it that were easily put into other places. And our um, director was violently opposed to cutting this scene. And so was our producer. It was our, one of our, big, our biggest disagreements. we had just a huge, huge fight about it. And finally, after weeks of, of fighting about this and, and are saying, why do you care so much about this scene? Joe Montello said, revealed to us that he had this whole plan about Elphaba's costume. <laughs> and, and when she would wear black, that he had worked out with Susan Hilferty and that she, the reason she wore black was she showed up at the funeral in her black dress. And she had totally. not worn black before that and that's why in the end, he, was, he really, really wanted that scene. And Winnie and I just said to him, I'm sorry, you cannot have a 10-page scene, no, 10-minute scene to get the leading character into a black costume. No one cares. No one is ever going to wonder why, she why she's wearing black. 
put her in black the scene before or something or the scene after, but you can't have it. But it's and so we, we finally, but boy, that was a struggle. It's, yeah. it's a version of, the fir of a first draft. I mean, it's a version yeah. of yeah. his first draft. Yeah. Yeah. I think we'll take some questions. Uh, there's a microphone in the center aisle. If you'd line up right in front of the microphone. It's mm -hmm. right behind you. Right yeah, behind you in the center aisle. And let's, I guess, make them as brief as possible. Ah. Sir. <coughs> yeah, I got, um, <coughs> when did you write uh, Popularity? Popular. In which uh, alphabet, yeah, yeah. <coughs> in which it, it was that like right it, early? Or there was always later? a scene from the from the first of um, the girls becoming we, uh, uh, the, the incident where where Glinda starts to feel that she's wronged Elphaba and they become friends. The, and the whole thing with the, the dance and, and giving Elphaba the hat that's that was in this original outline and. Um, and so we, I think in discussions with Mark Platt, um, Winnie had the idea or Mark had the idea that there should be this sequence that's, we, we called it the Emma sequence after the Jane Austen book, where the popular girl makes over the, the unpopular girl. Um, and so, and that seemed like a really funny idea and a really good idea for their relationship. And so pretty early on, I would say like about the sixth or seventh song that I wrote mm -hmm. was popular and it, only, it really d never changed. Um, a lot of songs get rewritten or whatever, but that really never got rewritten. Um, and I remember that I was so happy about the song that I did something that I almost never do, which is I sent the lyrics to Mark Platt um, before um, the, when I was going to get to, uh, together with him next and play it for him. And he read the lyrics and called me and had lots and lots of issues and <laughs> questions saying, I don't know about this. And I said, Mark, this is, you have to trust me on this. This one's going to work. Um, what did happen to the song was that when, uh, talking about Kristen, when they staged it, she basically invented a lot of this middle section about teaching oh, about yeah, how to flip her hair and everything that was there was a little teeny bit of training that we had written <laughs> into the song and then it got expanded into this huge hilarious um, sequence that that Kristen more or less invented yes ma'am hi a quick question when you shut down after San Francisco for the three months for the rewrites and people were on retainer um, did that mean you were able to use them at all? Could you workshop for yourself with actors or with, it was just back to the, to the computer? It never really occurred to us. That never occurred to us. <laughs> <laughs> no, they all went on vacation. We just, we just, we just worked. Yeah, now that you mention it, that probably would have been a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so you kind of retained them just to retain them. Well, but, so be, uh, there were certain um, equity right. and, uh, um, other other right. things where you, where you had to. So essentially, though, from the San Francisco stage draft to the Broadway stage draft was all um, on paper yeah. until you got it up for rehearsal. Correct. Yes. And yes. then when we got into rehearsal, you know, for broad, you know, for Broadway, we certainly, I was a change in things every day. Oh yeah. It's not right. like, um, but we weren't doing what he was terming the big structural rethinkings. At that point, yeah, no, we those were, had been done in the in the yeah, in the intro. and this is where it was such a great plan because honestly, things were cal were calmer when it was just the two of us working in his studio. You know, you need a bit of, as you all know, you need a bit of calm, and and, no and you're also not being told why technically you, this is why you can't change things out of town. Because you come up with an idea and they're like, well, we can, she can't make the costume change. Yeah, can't and do that. They, they can't change the set and we can't do, there are all these reasons that you're stuck with this production that's now screwing up your play. And, and so once you shut the production down, then you do these things and then they rethink the production. Um, so that's, that was the advantage of, of being able to do it on paper. Again. And how long was the rehearsal period for each of those productions, do you remember? Five weeks, the, I think they were, they, was the New York one again five weeks? I think it was three. It was five weeks the first time, the normal rehearsal period, and then endless tech. And then um, I think when we went back after the, the time off, it was another three weeks in the rehearsal room. Yes, that Thanks. sounds yeah. right. Next. Hi. Um, you talked a little bit about this, but I was wondering how, because most musicals are 
when you have the two and it's not just the one character that you're following through, most musicals are boy, girl centric. What can you talk a little bit about having both of the leads be female? Well, that was yes. Well, well, an interesting thing about this is is six years after the show opened or something, this terrific woman named Stacy Wolf wrote a a a, 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 a a thing for her college, a treatise about Wicked, saying that it was a queer version of Rodgers and Hammerstein, <laughs> which had never occurred to us. And then we just loved this because well, it was, it was true. It was very, it was insightful. very insightful. We basically did yeah. a Rodgers and Hammerstein relationship, like King and I, um, with but a friendship, with, but with, with a female friendship, and and in the way that the King and I relationship is basically sexless in that it's a love story, but they but it's not a, a romantic love story. That's that's what this was. But we didn't we didn't we weren't we were unaware that that's what we were doing while we were doing it. It's it's more like it just happened, and then as it was happening, there were other. I was just, you know, like we were describing, we were, we were seeing the feedback that the two women on stage, that was the heart of the musical. That was the beating heart of the musical. We were seeing that. It's not like I, it's not like I sat down conceptually going, I will write a musical with two women leads. <laughs> you know, that's my goal in life. I'm not saying that's a bad goal, but that wasn't how it happened. It occurred organically, seeing what we were seeing and going, look at them together. It's like, it's so fun or it's so <laughs> touching or whatever it was. Did you ever think that maybe Glinda, like, was there a moment maybe where like, oh, maybe we should follow Glinda? Was that, did that well, ever happen? Well, that's where I had to stop, like, stop writing Glinda <laughs> because he told well, you. Well, that, that didn't happen for a while. It went balance, out of balance. But did you ever yeah. consider like, Maybe we're doing this. No, because it's called because it's right. And, okay. Um, and what was and the, and the <laughs> but you know no that's not a bad question because you can be writing something and suddenly say oh I was doing this show but actually that one's more interesting but what but the 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 thing that excited me about this show and excited I think Winnie also from the get go was the brilliant genius idea that Gregory had that he was going to take this quintessential villain. The, someone who is, doesn't even have a name in the original, is referred to only by the, uh, the attribute that she is wicked, and make her the center the of the, 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 the protagonist of this piece. That was a stroke of genius, so that was always going to remain the center. We have time for two more questions. Um, Something that's been coming up a bit this weekend and something that I've begun to experience myself as an emerging writer is very often as writers how, in some ways, how little control we have over our show, how the show is developed, that we're always at the mercy of can we get the rights and how long do we have to wait and how long will the lawyers negotiate or what director can we get and I guess any thoughts on maintaining calm amidst what I'll just term, for better word, the fog of war, uh, the the fog and the confusion, all the different things. Yeah, that I mean, I think it's I think together. it's the na I, I would challenge your assertion about how little control we have over our show. I thought you were actually referring to something else, which is that the show reveals itself to us. Mm. Sometimes the show controls us, which is sort of what, what Winnie we're is talking saying. About. Sure. Yeah. But we, as writers, it's our show, and. It's, uh, you know, we like to, uh, we'll take collaboration ideas and input and help from, from anywhere we can get it. But in the end, it's, it's, it's our show. And um, there, so I think you have, that's what you have to maintain in the fog of war. You know, if you're having a fight about the scene that the, that the authors have decided the scene has to go, that scene went. You know, mm -hmm. in the end, we said we're the authors, and that scene is out of the show. The end, right. and that was a huge fight. But that's what happened. And we were right. And <laughs> we were because we knew we were right. That's the point. We knew we were right. But, but yeah, also, I just that. want to say quickly that you know, just you mentioned getting rights as one of your little nightmares, <laughs> and um, you know, sometimes it's best. To just if you're having a nightmarish time, you know, to stick to things where you 
where you don't have to get rights. Yeah. You know, I would encourage that. You just happen to mention it, so I'm sure. Um, but I would say that I, uh, you know, you don't want to when you're when you are starting out at any age, you don't want to have to worry about something like that. That's very daunting. Mm. You know, and I'm not I'm not look if it's if it's your heart's passion and you must do it, then of course you're going to do it. You're going to follow that. Mm. But you know, you want to be go easy on that kind of thing because the truth is you want to be like self-generating, you know, I think. And that will maybe give you more power. Yeah. Can we make the last two very brief? We yeah. have to vacate this room. Thank you. When you were fighting for the rights of this show, what argument did you make that this book needed to be on the stage instead of on the screen? Um, I said a few things to Mark. I said, first of all, that we all know what Oz looks like. And if, the, if it doesn't look like Oz in the movie, um, the audience is not going to go for it. Um, and you can, but on the stage, it's, it, it can be much more stylized. Secondly, I said you've got a leading character with a lot of stuff going on underneath. There's a lot of subtext. There's a lot that she's not saying. What? How are you going to do that in a movie? E even with a close-up, she's going to have a big prosthetic nose. She's going to be green. How are you <laughs> going to do that? What you need her to do is be able to soliloquize, and you can't really do that except with kind of really bad voiceover. So, so you need her to sing, to give voice to these things going on inside her, and that's weird in, in, in a movie, um, so it needs to start on stage. And ultimately, he bought those arguments. Uh, did Gregory Maguire have any involvement past giving his blessing, and how did he respond to the eventual production? He'd be happy. Yeah, he didn't. He was he was wonderful about it. Um, we were a little. I remember the first time he saw the show, which was one of the. We, it was like our fifth reading, I and mean, we'd been at it for a long time. And I was so nervous about Gregory coming, you know. And I, in the elevator on the way up to the rehearsal room where we were doing the reading, I was like, "Now you know we've changed a lot." And it's not. Like it. um, but what he, he said, he was great. He he, was what great. he said was, you know, I took the Wizard of Oz and I did with it what I wanted, and I feel like now you're taking what I did and you're doing with it what you wanted. He had some suggestions and some thoughts, um, a couple of which were very helpful to us, and we, you know, assimilated. But he never said, "You need to do my book in this in this way." Well, here's to the second decade of Wicked. Please let me thank Lee Holtzman. Let me, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. let me actually. Let me, I just want to, I just want to actually finish a comment because I think it's really, it's really appropriate because it has to do with adaptation. Um, apropos of that, I think it's very important if you're adapting somebody else's work that you have the right to do what you feel and in fact, if, you, if the person says, you can adapt my novel, but I have to approve your first draft or your this or that, do not do it. Turn it down. It's not a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now you can thank us. <laughs>